Hello guys, today is the, the, the internet is shaking. We are here with Ricard and tonight with the unforgettable. Ricard, it's a great place to have here with us today. Ram? Hello guys. Hello guys. Hello, hello Bruno, hello Venkat. Today we're going to have a nice presentation uh, of Venkat. And the talk's all yours, Venkat. You, this is an amazing guy. And we'll be here just watching and enjoying. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I have the absolute fond memories of visiting uh, Brazil and going to 12 different cities with uh, Bruno Souza when I was there. Had a great time with the user groups. Well, we got to meet virtually this time, but I'm as happy to be here talking to developers. So we, I'm going to spend about 40 minutes talking about uh, programming styles. Best time to ask question is any time you have the questions, so don't wait till the end. Uh, anytime is a great time. Ask questions along the way. You can also ask questions in the end as well. After the 40 minutes of talking, we'll spend more time uh, you know, answering questions, discussing. So let's get started. Uh, if you can confirm to me that you're able to see my uh, uh, screen, that'll uh, really be helpful as well. So there you go. Awesome. Let's get started. When it comes to programming, let's talk about what Java has been up to for a very long time. So the old Java, if you really want to think about Java in the past, uh, really was doing two things. It was doing imperative style of programming uh, plus the object-oriented style of programming. So this is how we programmed Java for several years into well over a decade is imperative plus object-oriented style of programming. Well, Java now uh, you know, is really imperative plus object-oriented plus the functional style of programming. So, so why did Java really take the leap into it? Well, functional programming has been around for a very long time. In fact, it's been around for longer than object-oriented programming. So there's a really good reason why Java decided to embrace functional style of programming. Well, so in order to talk about that, let's step back and think about the imperative style of programming. In imperative style of programming, we tell what to do and also take the time to tell how to do it. And, and this is basically the essence of imperative style of programming. This is one of the styles that's extremely familiar for us. We all have done that a million times over. So for example, if you were to think about, uh, let's say we have a list of integer values, we'll call it numbers is equal to, let's say list of, oh, let's go ahead and create a list of numbers, let's say one to 10. And if I want to really, uh, you know, find the find the total of double, let's say, of even numbers. Now, this is a very simple task, but what would you do first of all? You would first start with the variable, isn't it? We'll call it a result, knowing the result is a integer. And you would initialize that to a particular value. Then you would say for int i equal to zero, and then, of course, we will wonder, is i is equal to less than, is it numbers dot length, is it size, is it count? Well, there's a really no consistency in the word. So, of course, it's a size in the case of Java. Or you say, oh, come on, there is no reason to really do that. We could have simply said in element coming from numbers. But then, of course, what do we do? We have to say if element mark two is equal to zero, then of course we say result plus equal to element times two. Now notice that we were in charge of every single detail. So how does this really feel to write code like this? This feels like talking to a toddler. Now you probably spoke to a toddler when you were really young, maybe just a preteen, and you probably remember the first time you remember talking to a toddler, it's exciting. Oh, this little kid, it was great talking to the kid. And then you realize the second day and the third day and the fourth day, you got to say the same damn thing again. Uh, walk slowly, hold it with both hands, 
please don't step on that cat. And then you realize talking to a toddler becomes repetitive. And this goes on for the next 18 years. This is called parenting. So the point really is, this is a lot of effort to write the code. And what are some of the symptoms of imperative style of programming? Well, sure, it's very familiar for us. And that's one of the things I want to emphasize is sometimes programmers say it's simple, but they're confused with the term. We often confuse the word, word familiar with the word simple. Familiar is what we know. Simple is actually easy to work with and easy to understand. Familiar is not always simple and simple is not always familiar. So in this case, it often leads to accidental complexity. And we will see this in just a few minutes with another example. Second, it involves mutability. Now, why is this important to think about mutability? So notice over here, we have a variable result, but we are constantly changing that variable over and over and over. If I increase the volume of the computer and run the code, you will hear the variable result say, ouch, 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 because we're constantly changing that variable. Now, if somebody tells you to parallelize this code, the only right responses begin to laugh because it's so hard to parallelize code with mutability. You have an option to cry or to laugh. We might as well start, might as well start laughing. So the point is, it often involves mutability. That's a sign of imperative style code. We often use garbage variables. How many times we introduce variables that are not needed for the problem but they are needed for the solution. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have to deal with here as well. Let's talk about two problems over here and see how we solve them in imperative style. Then we will solve them in a declarative and functional style. So the first problem I'm gonna take is the following. Let's say for a minute, we are given some names is equal to list of in this case, and the list of, oh, let's take some names over here. Now, the question given is, uh, do we find Nemo, right? Our good friend Nemo is Nemo over there. How do we do this in the imperative style? Well, in the imperative style, we are going to first of all say Boolean found is equal to false. And then what do we do? Then we say for, uh, we say a string name coming from names. Then we say if name is equal to Nemo. And then you immediately correct me saying, no, Venkat, you have to really say dot equals. Now that is the how part that we talked about right there. We better really talk about this properly in terms of really equals, not double equals, but the dot equals that you have to really use. So that becomes a problem here as well. Then what do you do? You say, if it is equal to Nemo, then found is equal to true. And then of course you come outside and say, if found is equal to true, we will say Nemo found, and maybe we will just play a beautiful, wonderful, happy music. Otherwise we will say maybe Nemo not found and play a very sad music. But then you say, oh, when could you forgot something important? You forgot to put a break uh, statement. Oh yeah, those are important. If you don't put a break, depending on the problem, you may get a slow result or even a wrong result. So it may have a meaning to correct correctness of the program as well. We have to be extremely careful. So as a result, we need to be doing all the work all by ourselves. That's one of the biggest problems. So that is one example of imperative style solution where we had to really do all that work ourselves. And when we run the code, of course, the result is Nemo found, yay, that's great. But the problem is that's a lot of work we had to do all by ourselves. Well, we'll come back and talk about this problem one more time a little later on. So I'll just save that away, but let's move on a little bit further. Let's look at one other problem. The problem given here is, find, it's an extremely simple problem, isn't it? So the problem given is, find the total of double of k prime numbers starting from uh, n. Well, actually, in this case, find the total of double of k prime numbers. 
a question. If you would give one single tip to someone who wants to deliver the best talk ever, what would it be? Um, I, well, I, we'll address that in the end, if you don't mind. Uh, we will uh, keep the uh, questions for now on imperative style and functional style, but we'll open up the floor and talk about anything and everything. So if I don't address that question, please remind me and we'll get back to that. So, so in this case, you can see that we have the total of double of k prime numbers. How do we do this in the imperative style? Well, first of all, we will start with a public static, let's say Boolean is prime and we take a number. Now, what am I going to do within here? I'm going to say, again, Boolean divisible is equal to false. And then I will say for, in, uh, in this case, i equal to 2i less than number i plus plus. And then what are we going to do? We are then going to say if the number mod i is equal to 0, well, that's divisible. Then we say divisible equals to true, but break out of the loop. Then we come here and say return number is greater than one and is not divisible. Well, that tells us if a number is a prime number or not a prime number. On the other hand, given a number, let's say n equal to 101, just an arbitrary number. Let's say int k equal to, oh, let's say 51. Now, what do we want to do? Let's call this function called compute. And we pass to compute n and k. But what are we going to do in the compute function? Now, in the compute function, we are going to uh, return, in this case, uh, let's say the double value. And this is going to be compute and start with the n and the k or the given values. But look at the problem, though. Find the total of double of first k prime numbers starting with n. Oh, so we can start, first of all, index equal to n. Then we can say count is equal to 0. Then we can say double result is equal to 0, eventually return result. What did we do so far? Absolutely nothing useful. All we did was simply provide that three variables, and those are called really garbage variables. They're called garbage variables because those variables are not there for solving the problem because a problem needs it. Those are needed because of the solution we chose. If we chose a different solution, we wouldn't need it. It's kind of like, you know, let's say I want to go from, you know, uh, Sao Paulo to uh, Rio de Janeiro. I can drive with a friend or I can fly with a friend. But whether I drive or fly is a solution, not the problem itself. That's why these are based on the solution we decide, not on the problem itself. But then what do we do? Then we say while, keep in mind, this is still imperative, while count is less than k. And then what do you do? You come to a grinding halt at this point. I'm sure you have done this, isn't it? Every single time. You put the less than symbol, what do you do? You stop right there and ask the question, huh? You said less than or less than or equal to. Do you ever ask this question? Every single time. You know, people often ask me, what is that symbol called? And I say, that is the international symbol for I'm confused. Because every time you write it, we feel stupid, right? After writing it. So is it less than or less than or equal to? Well, okay, less than. Then we say if, and we say is prime of the index, right? So in this case, of course, we say index right there. And if it is prime number, what am I going to do? Then I'm going to say result plus equal to the index times two to really take the number and find the double and total it. So find the total of double of the first k numbers. And then what do we do? Oh, k numbers right there. Now, if I ask you, is the code correct? You're going to tell me, oh, no, it's not correct. Well, what did I forget? Oh, you got to increment the index, you would say. Okay, here you go. Increment the index. Is it correct now? And you're going to say, oh, no, it's not correct because you have to really increment the count, you say. All right, here's the count incremented. Is it correct now? And you are thinking, hmm, 
No, that's not correct. You need to do it outside, you say. So I move it outside. Is it correct? Then you say, no, 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 no. You got to move this inside and keep that outside. Oh, my goodness. What is that called? Complexity, isn't it? So it's complexity. And if you have to write code like this, how does it feel to write code like this? You know, Bruno taught me a word when it came to Brazil. This code is called Gambayaga, right? So that's whole imperative style is Gambayaga. And that's what you do over and over and over. And it is all these little patches and patches we do. And then it becomes incredibly, you know, it works great in our real world, but not so much for code. And, and that becomes really, really hard to maintain the code or in the long run. So this is an example of really a piece of code that is unnecessarily complex. And of course, when you run the code, it produces the result. But if you ask the programmers, you know, programmers are the best people in the world, the smartest people in the world. Because when you show a code like this to them and ask them, is it correct? They will never tell you it's correct. They always tell you, oh, it looks good. Very nicely laid, it looks good. Why? Because if they ever tell you it looks correct, it's correct, they'll know that it doesn't work later on. So it looks good is beautiful words to say. Well, I'm going to save this away as well. We'll come back and talk about this more. So we saw the perils of programming imperative style. And it's you look at this code, and what do programmers often say? They say, let me figure out what the code is doing. Well, that's a beautiful word, figure out. I don't want to figure out what the code is doing. I want it to be obvious when I look at the code. So let's take a look at what declarative style can do for us. So what is declarative style? Declarative style is where you tell what to do and not how to do it. So unlike the imperative style where you tell how to do, you only focus on the what and not the how. So the code becomes really expressive. You avoid unnecessary mutability. But the way you do this is by relying upon really the underlying libraries of code. So in other words, you build on top of a higher level of abstraction. Let's get a sense of the imperative style code with a little, uh, uh, sorry, the sense of uh, declarative style code with a little example. So let's go back and grab the example we saw earlier. Remember this example where we have the Finding Nemo example. This is imperative style. We told what to do, but we also told how to do it. Now let's do this code in the declarative style. So what are we going to do? Instead of writing all that code over there, let's simply take the last few lines alone and let's copy that over here. And then what we're going to do here is simply say if names.contains and I'm going to simply say Nemo and run the code and it does the work for us automatically. Obviously, I need the names over here. So as a result, we didn't have to really work so hard. It becomes a lot easier to write the code. So with just that one line of code, so what is contains? Contains is declarative. I'm going to pause for a minute here. Can somebody guess, given the code we saw here, to the code contains, can somebody guess how contains is implemented? Don't look at the underlying library right now, but just take a guess. How do you think contains is implemented uh, rather compared to what we did here? So what is your thought in terms of how it's implemented? Throw something that comes to your mind. What do you think is contains doing? How do you think it's implemented? Yeah, one response may be it is doing exactly what you see here, right? Well, that could be a really good answer. It's doing exactly what you do here. Another response is, oh, it's going using a fancy hash code to really find if the value exists. Maybe so. Maybe somebody said, oh, it's using parallel execution. The answer I like is, I don't care. Okay, how rude to say I don't care. Let's say it in a very polite way. It's encapsulated. Now, what does it mean it's encapsulated? 
I don't care. That's what it really means. So the point is, we shouldn't really worry about it. Now, clearly, we both can agree on one thing. As programmers, we need the details because we spend sleepless nights thinking about performance and various other constraints, memory usage, what have you. But the difference is this code says you have no choice. The details are on your face, whether you like it or not. And this code is like that old uncle we all avoid in the family get together, isn't it? You see that uncle and then you just take the other door and go away. That's what this code is. It will bore you with all the details, whether you like it or not, it's on your face. This one says the details are encapsulated. It's one layer below. And with a little click of a mouse, I will show you the details if you want to, but I'm not gonna bother you with it unless you really care about it. That is declarative style. So we saw the declarative style for the finding Nemo. And as a result, rather than writing all that code, we eliminated so much of our effort and we just told what to do. Tell me if it contains, not how to do it. So we can understand what the declarative style really is. And we were able to use the declarative style to really provide this very nicely. On the other hand, what can we, what is functional style then? Well, the functional style is really a combination of declarative style plus the use of higher order function. So functional style really is a combination of declarative style plus the use of higher order functions. So this is one of the reasons I get excited about functional style is that functional style is declarative. So if you think of a circle, and if you think of another circle around it, this inner circle is really functional. This outer circle is declarative. So you have the declarative style of programming and functional is a subset of that. So every code that is declarative, well, every code that's functional is also declarative. And, and that is one of the nice things about functional programming is it really leverages the power of declarative style of programming. The reason this is important to keep in mind is when we struggle to really think about a code in functional style, we can benefit from falling back to declarativeness. And once we really understand declarative, it becomes easier to bring it along. So the contains function that we saw earlier is an example of declarative. So obviously the question is, how does a functional style code really look? And for that, we need to understand what are called higher order functions. So what are really higher order functions? Well, when it comes to functions, we generally ask objects to, objects to functions. We do this all the time. We create objects in functions. We return objects from functions. And this is how we program with functions, methods in Java. But when it comes to higher order functions, so what are higher order functions do? Well, higher order functions, we can pass functions to functions. You can create functions within functions and return functions from functions as well. So the difference between regular functions and higher order functions is that just instead of passing objects around and creating objects, we can pass functions around and create functions as well within these higher order functions. So in other words, we build functions using other functions and that's basically becomes a functional style code. So to go back to the first example we saw, let's take a look at that code example again. So if I say numbers is equal to list of, let's say list of numbers one to 10 in this case, now I'm gonna say a double, a int result is equal to zero an output result. Remember, this is imperative style. So we say element coming from numbers. And then we said if element mark two is equal to zero, then of course result 
plus equal to e times two. That's the imperative style code we wrote earlier. Now, how does this look in functional style? Well, in the functional style, we will say numbers dot stream, and then we say over here, the next line here is dot filter. Given an element, we are going to return element mark two is equal to zero, only get me even numbers. Then we say map to int. Given an element, return element times two. And then finally, we call a sum function to perform the total. Now, it becomes clear about the imperative and functional style code right here. So the top one is imperative style code. But what about this? Notice this line, if you will. This is declarative, isn't it? Why? Because tell what and not how. Look at this buddy here. Uh, this is imperative. Why? Uh, tell what and die telling how, right? So that's basically what we do. We got to spell out every single detail right here and here and here, everything. And to make things worse, we may do like break and continue and stuff like that as well in this code. So this is basically all the details we have to tell. On the other hand, tell what and not how. Hey, what about this line of code? Notice we are, this is declarative. You tell it to print a map, a transformation. What about this code? It is declarative as well because you tell it to filter. But in both the places, plus a use of higher order function. How so? Because to the filter function, you are passing that anonymous function, the lambda expression. And to the map to int function, you are passing a lambda expression as well. So the filter and the map into int are higher order functions. So here, the filter is the higher order function. Here, the map to int is the higher order function. As a result, these two are really functional in nature. So these two are functional because they are declarative and they use higher order functions like filter and map to int. And that's what makes it a, a, a really a functional style code. Now, what is the benefit of doing this way? Well, the benefit is that while the imperative style code contains complexity, the functional style code has less complexity. So in that regard, there are two things we need to really be careful about. I said functional is equal to declarative, first of all, uh, declarative plus the use of higher order function. However, it is also true that functional, really functional programming is really a combination of functional composition plus the use of lazy evaluation. Now, let's think about it. If I ask you, what is so cool about object-oriented programming? Well, object-oriented programming talks about abstraction, talks about uh, encapsulation. It also talks about uh, inheritance, right? And of course, you also talk about polymorphism as well. Now, which of these four is the most important? We will say it's polymorphism. So I'm going to say polymorphism uh, is to OOP as lazy evaluation is to functional programming. So lazy evaluation is extremely important. What is functional composition? We saw how we have filter and map and uh, sum. That's the functional composition. The data flows through this pipeline one after another. But that's not enough. Functional composition is necessary, but not sufficient. We also need lazy evaluation. To illustrate this, let's go back to the other example we saw earlier, which is finding the double of, total of double of prime numbers starting with n. So here is the imperative style code we wrote earlier to do the work. So if you look at the imperative style code we did, what did we have in the imperative style code? Well, first of all, we had this function uh, is prime that we wrote. 
Then what we did is we wrote the compute function, if you recollect. And here is the imperative style compute function we wrote. And then finally, in the main, we were calling the compute function using the values of n and k. So let's bring that over here. And that's the code we wrote. So when I run the code, that's the imperative code that gave us the result. Now, what I'm going to do here is use functional style of programming. But before we do functional, what do we want to do? So a uh, functional, right? That's what we want to do. Functional uh, style. And you say, think declaratively and code functional. So that's basically what you want to do. So you want to think declaratively and code in a functional style. Oh, what is the principal difference on reactive programming versus functional programming? That's a really good question. You know, I've, I've been struggling with reactive programming for a while, and I almost jumped out of my seat. And I yelled out one day saying, reactive programming is really functional programming plus plus. Well, the reason I say that is, the reactive programming is built on top of the ideas of functional programming, functional composition, and lazy evaluation. So what does that mean plus plus then? So it uh, is based on the functional, uh, functional ideas, but reactive programming, uh, programming uh, what it does is programming uh, takes uh, the code through um, uh, through really right and this uh, through uh, a higher level of abstraction so higher level of abstraction so what does that really mean in that context well functional programming uh really when it comes to functional programming we deal with uh, a stream of data in reactive programming uh, we normally have uh, three channels the channels are data channel, the error channel, and then of course we have the completed channel as well. So as a result, uh, reactive programming uh, takes a better handle, if you will, on exception, on dealing with exceptions. So functional programming doesn't really deal with exceptions really well because it's an imperative style of programming. So what do we do in reactive programming? We treat error as data and flow it down the, the functional, uh, functional pipeline, right? So this is where really nice things about reactive programming is that it's really based on the idea of functional programming. So you take the functional pipeline, but you divide it into three channels of communication, a data channel, an error channel, and then of course, a completed channel. So, so that's one of the relationship between those two. So coming back to this right here, you first want to think declaratively and then code functionally at that point. So how do we do this? Let's put this into words, if you don't mind. So notice when I run the code, it produced the output. But I want to change this code into a functional style. But what are we going to do? Uh, given a number, a number is prime, is prime uh, if it is greater than one and is not divisible by any number in the range uh, two to number minus one. So now notice, I declaratively said what it is. A number is a prime number if it is greater than one and is not divisible by any number in the range two to one. Let's do that then. So notice, I take all this and delete it. Poof, it's gone. Then I say over here, number is greater than one, that's what this said here, and is not divisible by what? By no number in the range. So I am going to say over here, oh, absolutely. So I'm going to say over here, thank you. And I'm going to say in here that number is greater than one and, and I'm going to say that the interstream dot range two to number. So in the range, two to number minus one. And, and then what am I saying here? Dot none match, given a number i in that range, number mod i is equal to zero. So that becomes the 
functional style for computing if a number is a prime number. So we think declaratively and then we can code functionally at that point. So we convert that code into functional style. What about this funny code, which is trying to give us so much trouble? Well, let's think about this for a minute. One of the key things about functional programming is functional composition plus lazy evaluation. So what is lazy evaluation? Imagine I give you an apple, not the computer, but a fruit. You can do four things with an apple. The first thing you can do is maybe you can just eat the apple right away. Maybe you're hungry. Or you can throw it away. Or you can keep it for later. Or you can give it to a friend. So you can do four things. You can eat it now, throw it away, keep it for later, or give it to a friend. Imagine I give you a function instead of an apple. You can execute the function now, discard it, run it later, or pass it along. That's basically what lazy evaluation is. Lazy evaluation is you postpone evaluation until you no longer can postpone it. Oh, uh, a question here. What is the most important design pattern in functional reactive programming era? Well, I think there are quite a number of important patterns. I don't think there is one. But the beauty is some of the patterns we know before, they're kind of useless. Some of the patterns we uh, used before become lightweight and prominent. And some of the patterns we never used before becomes really exciting. I'll give you examples of these. Uh, one of them is the strategy pattern. If you really think about it, you are passing a lambda to a function. What is that? That's like a strategy, isn't it? Because you are telling the function to do its work, but you are varying a small dependency of the strategy. So the strategy pattern, instead of being an interface and a bunch of classes, trickles down to a beautiful little function lambda we pass. So strategy is very important in functional programming. It shines everywhere we see. Function composition can be used to create decorator and chain of responsibility. We all have used decorators and chain of responsibility, and they're smelly because you create monstrous chain objects. All that goes away because of functional composition, life becomes easy. And then, of course, we really think about the uh, uh, patterns like execute around the method pattern, something we don't do often in Java, but languages that have functional programming offer the execute around method pattern. Now that Java has lambdas, we can use execute around method pattern really well. And also compose method pattern shines really nicely because of functional composition. So to answer your question, some patterns really become lightweight and beautiful. And some patterns we never really experienced come to light as well. So it's very fun to be able to use them. Going back to this compute function, we want to change this into functional style code. So how do we do that? Well, let's give it a try. Notice what I'm going to do here. First of all, I'm going to start with a return, first of all, stream.iterate and stream.iterate. Start with the number n that's given. Given an element, element plus one. That's an infinite stream. Now, infinite stream has no bounds at all. n, n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, n plus four, n plus five. It keeps on going. Now, obviously, we can create an infinite stream, but that's where lazy evaluation comes in. So it's absolutely lazy. So it's not going to run that code until you demand for that value, hence laziness. So, so right there is lazy evaluation. Then you have a dot filter and sample is prime. So you ask if the given number is a prime number. That's line number 16 that we saw. Well, if it is prime, what do we do? Then we say dot map to double, and I'm gonna say given the element, return element times two. That is line number, part of line number 17. Then you say a dot limit, limit what, k? 
Well, is it K or less than or equal to K? It's K, damn it, keep moving. You don't have to worry about that silliness. Then you say a dot sum and perform the total of that computation. So when you run the code, what are you going to get out of this? A double of the first K prime numbers starting with N. But the code begins to read like the problem statement. If you give this code to somebody, ask them to find out what the code is doing. And while they are looking at it, you can eat their lunch. Well, here you can be nice, much nicer. They can tell you what the code is doing and you both can go have a good lunch. So this says, given all the numbers starting with N, give me all the prime numbers starting with N, give me the double of all the prime numbers starting with N, but only give me K of them and I want to total it. So the code in this case begins to read like the, uh, the problem statement, right? So problem statement. And as a result, it becomes easier to understand, easier to maintain. And, and there, what we have is the functional, uh, functional composition. So both of those are extremely important. In other words, we want the pipeline. So pipeline that is evaluated lazily on demand uh, is really the characteristics of the functional programming uh, is one of the key ingredients. But of course, a lot of things hinge on this lazy evaluation. And as a result, lazy evaluation relies upon a lot of things we have to do correctly. But hopefully that gives you an idea about where that is taking us is that really it's this combination of functional composition plus the use of lazy evaluation. Both of those are highly critical for programming in functional. So why do I want to do this? which looks a lot different from what we are familiar with. It's because one of the reasons is that imperative style code in general uh, code has accidental, uh, uh, accidental complexity. On the other hand, declarative and functional style code uh, has less complexity, relatively speaking. So as a result, that's one thing better. And as a result, it also becomes easier to maintain, easier to understand. That's the first thing, right? Easier to understand. Uh, that's the very first thing. Uh, easier to test because these are pure functions. Easier to modify and maintain. And guess what? It is also uh, easier to parallelize. And then finally, a lazy evaluation also provides uh, you know, pretty good performance, but we can say lazy evaluation uh, and our parallel execution also provides pretty good performance. So these are some of the reasons why I would like to really make the code functional because functional style code has these benefits overall. Well, that's why I'm going to stop talking. I want to really uh, take a time to listen to your questions, your thoughts, your views, your suggestions, your opinions, just about anything you would like to say. So I'm open for hearing your thoughts. There is a link that's been posted. If you take note of the link, you will be able to uh, participate using that link and for a draw as well. So while we are waiting for questions to be posted, let me start with one question for you. Uh, this is a pretty hard question. Uh, what is the most favorite animal for a functional programmer? I, I know Bruno Souza has a, a lot of animals at his home. I absolutely enjoyed right from parrots to dogs and such. But my question is, what is the most uh, favorite language of a functional programmer. So any anyone who could guess, what is it? All right, no guesses yet. Uh, let me give you the answer then. It is lambda. So it's lambda, right? So the functional programmers love lambs. It's lambda. So 
All right, I'll take your questions from here on. Uh, so let's let's see if I can scan through the questions here. So uh, easy to test and easy to test automation, that is absolutely true because uh, functions are pure functions and that really has an impact. Um, so how can I improve when it comes to writing code in functional way? That's a really good question, Victor. So one of the ways that I've found to be really good is to, to I'll give you two answers for that. I'm a huge fan of this mantra called make it work and, ma and make it uh, better real soon. So typically what I tend to do is I often write automated tests and I write my code in the automated test and write the code in imperative style. Then I come back and refactor the code to functional style. As long as the test is passing, I keep uh, making it better. Uh, the second approach I often take is uh, I often write some code and go to a colleague and say, let's sit down and refactor this code together. This is a really good way to uh, get better at writing functional style code. I might get stuck writing it, but when I sit with somebody, uh, I'm going to be able to learn better and think loud as well. I said two ways, but I'll give you a third way also. Uh, to really force ourselves to think declaratively before we jump on to functional style. So, so work with automated test and then come back and refactor the uh, code after that. And then second is that you want to really focus on uh, uh, taking the code, but you know, work with the colleague to refactor it. And third, think declarative before thinking functional. Um, uh, Lightson has a question here. How much performance gain are we talking about here? Well, it's actually not a performance gain. It's not a loss of performance. Let me give you an example really quickly here, if you if you don't mind. So let me go to the code to show this to uh, here. So let's say for a minute, if I were to say numbers over here, numbers is equal to, let's say list of, let's go ahead and just take some numbers here. So let's say one, two, three, but a five, four, a six, seven, a eight, and a, let's say nine and 10. If I were to write this code in the imperative style, what would we do in general? If I'm writing the code in the imperative style, I would say output, well, first of all, pardon me, I would say, uh, uh, let's say int result is equal to, uh, well, integer rather, and is equal to null, what a smell already, but then I will output the result in the very end but I'm looking at the performance in this case. I'll give you two answers for performance question. The first is, I'm gonna say for int element coming from numbers, and I can say here, if element is greater than a certain value and is even for that value, then I say element result is equal to, uh, let's say double it element, and then you do a break. So what is this code going to do? If I say public static boolean, let's say in this case is uh, greater than, so uh, is greater than, let's change that to is greater than. So if I say is greater than and int number, and I'm going to simply say over here, return n is, uh, let's say greater than three. Now I'm going to create the next two functions here. So the next function is is even, and this is going to simply say mod 2 is equal to 0. And finally, let's change this to an int double it. And what does the double it function do? Return times 2. Well, if I run the code, the result is uh, 8. But if I write the code in the functional style, what is that going to look like? I'm going to output right there. And I'm going to say numbers.stream dot filter and the filter says is sample uh well sample is greater than and then a filter and sample is even dot map and sample double it and then finally dot find the first and then i say or else give me a zero so when i run the code this time the result of both the calls are pretty much identical.
But the question is, well, how much did we expand in performance? To answer that question, let's go back here and put a little line over here and let's run this one more time so we can see what it's doing. So you see eight and then eight, but I go back up here and say output right there. Let's output, we'll say e is greater than called for plus n. Let's do the same thing for this one, which is gonna be e is even. And finally for this one, which is gonna be double it. When I run the code this time though, notice they both perform exactly the same amount of work. So we didn't do any extra work at all. So we didn't degrade the performance. So that's one thing. So you're not wasting time processing six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, or anything after that. That's one thing. But secondly, though, if you come to me and say, I really want speed. I always say this to people. Uh, when, when, when I want speed, uh, please don't tell me you will give me a faster bicycle. Uh, I am looking for a rocket. So that's one of the things I always want to say. So when I say I want speed, don't tell me you'll give me a faster bicycle. What I really want is really a rocket. So what I mean by that is, I don't want you to make my imperative code faster. What I want is the gain I can get by running the code in parallel if I really have a lot of data to process. So the idea really is that you really want to be able to gain speed with performance by using parallel and it's incredibly hard to parallelize imperative code, but it's really easy to parallelize functional style code. So on one hand, we didn't do any extra work. On the other hand, it's incredibly easy to parallelize that code. So I hope that kind of answers your question in terms of where the gains are, is that we get performance from functional style code because it doesn't do any wasteful computation. If even though the code looks like we filtered all the data, we really did not. And, and that is one of the reasons why this is really performant in that it's not doing any wasteful work. That's the reason for that. Um, when the Lambda first appeared in Java 8, I really like, but what do you think about link for C Sharp? Well, link actually took a different route, honestly. Uh, don't get me wrong. I love C Sharp for many reasons, but this is not one of them. When C Sharp introduced link, they didn't come out and say functional programming, lambdas. They introduced link and link where like the query of data in memory, like the query of databases. So link is really SQL for in-memory data. They embraced lambdas much later. The reason I'm not a big fan of what they did is not that they did a poor job in introducing that. It is that it was the old way versus the new way. The code written before link and the code written after link are two separate code in the case of C sharp. You can't call an existing code with the link all of a sudden. What Java did really nicely is provide that backward compatibility. So Java said, by creating the functional interfaces, we can take old existing code, which uses runnable and callable and file filter, and we can pass lambdas to them. We can take our own code, which is using these kinds of uh, functional interfaces, and we can pass lambdas to them. So Java did a better job, in my opinion, by directly embracing head-on and addressing head-on functional programming rather than taking the circuital route of throwing in link and then coming and introducing action and funk 
Those are the two things available in C Sharp, whereas Java, I think, has done a much better job in terms of really embracing it. So, so having used both, uh, even though I like C Sharp for a lot of different reasons, Lambdas and Link is not one of the areas where I give credit for C Sharp. I think they could have done a better job, in my opinion. How would you uh, uh, how would you write a chain of business logic in a functional manner in Java? For example, you must check if something is in a state A, then uh, uh, send an email, uh, save it uh, to database, and post it to Kafka. Well, one of the things you got to be careful, uh, Eduardo, is that you want to be very careful with side effects because if you have side effects, then lazy evaluation will not work properly and it'll mess up your code really bad. So what you really want to do is this really goes back to the design of a functional code. So design of functional code is you want the functional uh, pipeline, pipeline to be pure. Now there are exceptions to what we do, but we gotta be really careful about it. So in other words, what you wanna do at least in concept and theory, we need to keep an eye on this, is you want the uh, functional pipeline to be pure and any side effects you perform, you wanna do it after you exit the pipeline. So uh, do uh, side effects uh, after you exit the pipeline. Uh, now, of course, after having said that, if you are not really taking the changes in one stage, and using it in another stage. So in other words, what I want to emphasize here is uh, what we really need to look out for is uh, the uh, change to a shared state. This is a no-no. So you definitely don't want to change any shared state. So having said that, how would we actually do something like what you said? Well, what you can do is you can take the data, right? Whatever you get, you can do the stream, you can do the filter, and you can say, you know, does it meet the condition? You can check for that. And, and once you check for that condition, what I would do is I would then say for each, and then I would say uh, perform uh, side effects, right? Uh, so this is the terminal operation that you want to really do. And, and in this function, perform side effect, I would do the sending of email. I'll do the updating of the database. I'll do the sending off to a Kafka stream. I would be doing it in, in that phase. What I would not do is split that into three different stages. I wouldn't do that part because I will want to group my side effects to as minimum as possible. If I start leaking all over and do side effects, that's a disaster in the making. We don't want to do that. So what you want to do is as much as you can, and, and, and this is not said lightly, keep these pure. You know, as much as you can, uh, keep these pure functions and save all your side effects to the terminal operation in the very end. So what you don't want to do is to cause a side effect and do a decision based on that side effect that's not going to work. So, so that is something we need to be careful about in, in how we do this. Uh, and also keep in mind, you don't have to really do a lot of things in the Lambda. I have a rule that I follow. And the, and the rule is that the Lambda, Lambdas must be a glue code, uh, two lines, two lines may be uh, too many. So I will never want to write a multi-line Lambda. You don't want to put a curly brace and then start writing more into it. Definitely not what we want to do. So keep them extremely small. Simply call the methods that perform the side effects. That's basically what we really need to do to, to handle that uh, you know, way of writing code to talk to uh, external services, that is. Um, so Fabio asks, uh, which one do you prefer in reactive programming, reactor style or uh, Multini. I don't really have any particular preferences. Uh, I, I try not to really have such preferences in general. Uh, it, it really comes down to the problems I'm solving. 
Uh, and I also try not to get too attached to libraries, honestly. So I tend to really stay away uh, from, from those decisions. Uh, I try to focus more on the core fundamentals. That way it gives me the leeway to uh, pick and choose the right solutions for the right job rather than carrying uh, that kind of preference. So I generally work at a much lower level than uh, having preferences at that uh, level, unfortunately. I, I don't really uh, tend to pick or choose in that area. Um, so Robson asks, uh, functional programming requires immutable data to work better with parallel, not just parallel, but with lazy as well. So do you think Java API collection needs more intuitive work with immutability as it is with Scala or, or even without Scala, right? So there's there, without comparing to Scala, uh, Java has a lot of work to do in this area because if you really think about it, there is this concept of uh, tries and tries was actually uh, first implemented in Clojure. And then of course it was implemented in Scala but price gives you the ability to uh, perform uh, an immutable uh, implementation of uh, list versus uh, collections or hash map, if you will, dictionaries. Uh, that is one thing definitely would be useful. Uh, but but Java also, you know, took a very small step. They introduced two, in, uh, two um, so they said two uh, unmodifiable list, two unmodifiable set. They introduced this function in uh, Java 11, I think, where you can create a, a list out of the collect function, which are immutable. But Java has a long way to go. Uh, but, but here's the beautiful thing. Uh, Java, you can use third-party libraries in Java as well. So you can use Clojure or Scala library from within Java if you really want to or you can use third-party implementations. So while it'd be nice to have these in the JDK, we don't have to wait for that. But also to be fair, um, there is an enormous burden on Java to evolve and they cannot possibly do everything in a short amount of time. You and I cannot do everything in a short amount of time how could we expect them to do it? So, so they have to pick and choose based on priorities. And so their priority is not there at the moment. It might become later on, but in the meantime, we can you know, use third-party libraries uh, and, and our design uh, to work around the limitations we see in Java. So in an ideal world where we can expect these to be provided, in a realist realistic world, we got to sympathize with where the language came from, uh, from being imperative and object oriented. Uh, you know, the, the saying goes, right? Uh, it's really hard to you know, turn around a ship. You know, you and I know this. If you're starting a greenfield application, you can design for what you know. But if I come to you and give a legacy application and tell you to change direction, we're going to have a lot of hard time. Well, Java is that legacy. So I'm really sympathetic to, to that. Uh, while I can demand uh, change uh, to a great extent, uh, we have to be realistic as well, I think. Um, uh, Suresh asked the question, at micro level, will stream not create more objects that needs to be uh, garbage collected? Uh, yes and no. So it, it all comes down to a trade-off, right? So, you know, if, if I were to uh, choose a solution, the solution has a cost, but the benefit is there with it. If the cost versus benefit is really high, I don't want to use it. If the cost versus benefit is really low, meaning very little cost for a lot of benefit, I want to use it. So to answer your question, there are two things to consider. The, the first is, if you consider let's say numbers is equal to, uh, let's say in this case, list of, oh, let's start with uh, numbers one, you know, one to 10, for example, in here, list numbers one to 10. And, and given this, if I were to say in here, uh, if I say, for example, dot filter, and given an element, element mark two is equal to zero, and, and then let's do a map and say element is element times two, and then let's say for each, and let's say system.out, and we'll do a print line. Now I want you to notice a couple of things here. 
we created a lambda for filter and a lambda for map. But on the other hand, we did not create a lambda for the for each. Now, what are the consequences of this? Well, the first consequence of this really is that in this particular case, uh, you have, uh, oh, numbers is equal to, let's see what I did wrong here. So uh, I want to say var numbers is equal to list of numbers. We call a scream on it, and then we execute it. Uh, let's see, this is going to be the list of integers. I'm going to just say list of integers for a minute. Uh, not sure exactly what it was unhappy with, but we'll find out. So, so in this case, as you can see, uh, system .out, uh, uh, double colon print line cannot be converted to a list over here. Uh, obviously, I'm throwing a blank at what I'm doing right here. So anyway, if you look at this here in the bytecode level, uh, what are we going to really notice is the question. Well, what you're going to notice at this point is that when you compile this code, so you take the stream uh, given to us, and obviously, it's giving me error because I'm trying to save the result of for each. So let's go back and run the code right now. And, and what is the consequence of this? Let me switch here to, if you don't mind, the bytecode, and let's take a look at this really quickly. So if I go back to the directory where I have this code, so in the work area, Java, Java, so I'm going to compile this by manually, Java C minus D attempt classes, sample.java. So I compile that code, but I'm going to say Java P, you know, where is Java P, which Java P, that Java P right there. So I'm going to take that Java P and I'm going to say Java P minus C minus P minus S and ask for temp classes sample dot class. And let's take a look at the bytecode that got generated. And if I look at the bytecode, what do I notice in the bytecode? Well, first thing I notice here is that in this code, I'm going to look for invoke virtual, as you can see right there. So that's the first thing to really think about is the, the lambdas that you see here did not become objects. They became a call to a function as an invoke virtual. So they're not anonymous inner classes. That's definitely a good news. Why? Because we're going to call these maybe millions of times. You don't want to be creating objects and objects and objects. That would be a lot of garbage. Be assured that's not happening. We are simply calling an invoke virtual function right there. Secondly, here are the lambdas that we created sitting as functions, as you can see. But then when you look at the function where we call the print line, we don't even have an invoke virtual. Instead, it simply called the print stream uh, uh, function directly rather than creating, uh, pardon me, we don't have an extra function. Instead, it directly called the print stream function rather than really creating a function. So to answer your question, uh, first of all, no extra object here. And in here, no extra function. Well, then that leaves only one thing, and that is there is a stream object being created here and a stream object being created here and a stream object being created here. But those stream objects are extremely lightweight. All they do is fuse these calls together to form the functional pipeline, and when you are done, that stream really is simply put that combination of those functions into a stream. So as a result, that overhead is absolutely negligible. So the real problem would have been, to answer your question, Suresh, is, is these guys, if we had been creating objects over and over, so we are not doing it, and any other overhead is far and few. It's really a wash when it comes to what we do, so it's not a concern. This is one of the things we have to be careful as programmers. We often tend to look at extremes, which is really not to our benefit, because we always get what we ask for, but keep in mind, we don't get what we didn't ask for, and the things we didn't ask for probably were more important than what we asked for. So if you said no overhead, well, that's what you end up getting, no overhead, but you lost all the other benefits. But if you said 
a reasonable overhead. So everything is really coming down to, uh, is it good enough? Am I getting, it's a balance, right? So I want to have a nice balance of what I do. I never want extremes because if I want extremes, I win on one and lose on everything else. So software development is full of trade-off and we want a balance of what we do and we reduce the complexity and we have reasonable performance. This is great. Or I can get the super more performance, which really is not that super. And I have enormous complexity. I cannot maintain the application. Now I cannot make it parallel also. So that's why it's important to evaluate the trade-off and, and, and go for what makes really good sense with that balance. Um, oh, Sassi has a question. Uh, all, uh, although one of the benefits of using stream is making parallel is easy, but in real parallel streams are not usually recommended or cautioned, what are the use cases? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I actually give a talk uh, called a uh, power and perils of parallel stream. And in the talk, I spent 10 minutes talking about how cool parallel streams are and spent 80 minutes talking about why we should not use them. So, so what is wrong with parallel streams? Well, the first thing about parallel streams is they are so easy to create, which really means we can flip that switch without thinking the consequences of it. I call parallel streams as the master switch. What I mean by that is be extremely careful flipping that master switch because that's going to flip things open and boom, you may not want what you just you know result to do. So, so as a result, be careful with that switch. Now, the problem is when you create a parallel stream, by default, it gives you as many threads as the number of cores on your machine. What that means is when you have as many cores and the machine and the thread that you have, what's going to happen is you are going to run computation intensive jobs in it. Great. You're using that particular stream. But imagine for a minute that you created a parallel stream, but on the stream you run, let's say, computation intensive job. And also, let's say you run a, a IO intensive job. This is a disaster in the making. Why? Because computation intensive jobs require as many threads as the number of course, no more. IO intensive jobs can use more threads. These two are such a wide different problem, you cannot put them here. But even worse, right? It may not be this obvious. You might call some function dot map and you call func. Within func, you may have a computation intensive job, which then calls an IO intensive job. This becomes a disaster in the making at that point. So that's one problem. Second, to answer, address this, you create a fork join pool and you put the parallel stream one into this. Then you create another fork join pool and you put parallel stream two into it. Now this becomes very smelly and messy. Now every corner you turn, you gotta ask the question, this is computation intensive. I should run it in pool one. This is IO intensive. I gotta run it in pool two. How do you manage all of this? And to get these correct, is a Herculean job. And as a result, this becomes uh, really, really hard. And as a result, it's very error prone as well. So it starts out being, oh, it's so easy. And then it becomes this Frankenstein mess to deal with over time. And getting parallel steam to work correctly is really hard in the long run. So this is one of the things that looks easy to the human eye and comes back really haunting us in the long run. And third problem with parallel streams is it's non-deterministic. So if you really want uh, uh, the output in a certain order, 
It's really hard to do that with parallel stream. And finally, parallel and lazy don't go together. It is either parallel or it's lazy. Lazy says, save your work. Parallel says, fire on all cylinders. Waste resources if you have to, to get the response quickly. Sorry, you cannot balance the two. So, so that's one of the reasons why we gotta be very careful. If you honestly ask me, parallel streams is the least favorite of the streams API for me because it's really fun to get in, but really hard to get out uh, safely after that. So we gotta be very careful. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm saying be very careful evaluating that. That's very important. Let's see if there's other questions we can take. Unless we're out of time. Yeah, we have many, many questions. You have one surprise. You have Bruno over here with us. Oh, hi. Hey, Venkat. So good to see you, man. A virtual hug for you. Yeah, it's a virtual hug, man. That's awesome. Awesome to, to have you here. Thank I you. Was, I was surprised you remember the Gambiaha. That was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was there was a, there was a question here, uh, just like a, a easy question here. So I, I can get the easy question. Can I not, Vinkat? So Satsi is asking about how to run multiple Java versions seamless in the system, right? And they want to try the version 10, 14, 11, 14. So how how do you do this, Vinkat? I use the SDK, SDK man uh, to do, the answer, to do this. And so I don't do that, but I want to emphasize that is the answer. Right. So, so you definitely want to use, uh, thank you, Sashi. Uh, definitely want to use SDK man. Uh, but, but I, I do things a little differently only because I'm crazy. Uh, right. so what I have in my machine literally is, uh, I have an opt directory. Let me quickly show you what I have here. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting people do this, but I just, since your question is, what do I do? I'll show you what I do. So, so on my machine, I have a opt Java directory where I have multiple versions of Java sitting. And, and what I have done is something absolutely silly. I've got a symbolic link called current. And when I want to switch Java version, so here I have a Java version, which is 14, and I say change current to, oh, let's say uh, JDK 11. So I just need to run that command and I run Java version that becomes 11. So, so the reason I do this is, I might be working on a, on a window, but I want to really try out different versions uh, quickly. And, and I want that to globally change on my system. Uh, I mean, like I said, I do crazy stuff uh, around, but uh, if I'm working on a project, uh, then I would say definitely going that uh, you know route of SDK man uh, is the way to do. Uh, and, and that is probably the most sensible way to do. So I can really <laughs> agree with that recommendation. All right, okay. Uh, so one, one said as they come in is the best tool. Okay, I, I, I agree with that. All right, very cool. So uh, let me just kind of just, just let, let him, you know, because Vinkat, you just mentioned something really quick, but I just want everyone to know this. Uh, we're going to give away two tickets for uh, this the, the TDC Sao Paulo events, a fully online event, uh, and, and we're going to give away two tickets. And let me tell everyone here, we are gonna that's that's totally news right we, we have not announced that yet and so you are you all gonna be the first ones to know we are gonna have an international track at this event so we're gonna have international speakers uh we're gonna have for all of you international audience that's here so thanks Venkat to bringing some international people here for us right so all of you here in the international audience uh we're gonna have a totally free international uh, uh for 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 foreigners to come to the international track on TDC, right? So, uh, and if if you're Brazilian and you want to go to one of the tracks that are not free, we're gonna give you a, 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 a ticket, two tickets right now. So go. So someone's gonna put a, a link on the on the chat again. So don't miss that, right? It's it's you you gotta go click on the link so you can get part of the giveaway. All right, just a quick note. <laughs> cool. So that's bit.ly 2xho5qt. 
All right, you you go you go in the chat and click on the link. I think it's a little bit better than just trying to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I put the chat. Is it, is it posted right. on the chat? Yeah, it's yeah. posted. It's posted in the chat. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So Venkat, um, there was one question at the very beginning. I know that you. Uh, I know you're talking about. Uh, uh, you know, uh, functional programming here and everything. But there was a question at the very, very beginning, and there was, I, I don't remember who asked that because I was just kind of looking quickly. Someone asked, what is the most important skill to be such a great speaker as you are? So what, what would you say? Elder, ask. Elder asked this question. Okay, that's even better. So, Elder, so, yes. Yeah. So so um, one of the things I would, so so I, I, what, what I normally say is this, when, when I give a talk, uh, on Java, I've got people like Brian Getz and Mark Reinhold in the audience. Right. When I when I give a talk on Scala, there's Martin Oderski in the audience. Uh, it would be foolish of me even to imagine that somehow I know even as much as they do, because those are the people who created this stuff, right? But there's one thing that I can do that nobody in the world can do for me, which is talk about my experience, my journey, the lessons I've learned. And I think that's kind of one of the most important thing is to be genuine about bringing our own experience. Uh, you know, as a speaker and as anybody, right, programmer, speaker, we know a lot, but we don't know a lot more. And I don't think there's ever a reason to hide that fact that we don't know stuff. That's okay. And 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 so to be genuine, to share our experience. And one of the things, and we've talked about this, uh, Bruno, before, is right. one of my mantras is, you know, tell a story, not a tale. Uh, people love stories. So if you're able to tell a story of, oh, I was using this API, and here's the problem I had with it, or I was using this, and here's the benefit I got out of it, so to keep it short and tell your story, uh, people really enjoy it. Uh, but also, I think uh, one of the things that people often uh, like is uh, to they want they come to the talk. I often emphasize this. They come to the talk for learning, and so it's all about the audience and and, and never about the speaker. So one of the mistakes I think speakers often do is they get overly nervous thinking, how do I impress the audience? I think that's a really wrong approach. We never want to impress the audience, though what we really want to do is to help the audience learn about the stuff they came to learn. And I cannot tell you how many times I sit in a talk, and uh, there are two things I care about in a talk. One is information density. Uh, I, you know, the, the most precious thing in this world is our time. You know, mm -hmm. time is infinite, but yet we are given a limited amount of it. And if I ask you to spend an hour of your time with me, I need to have the deepest respect for that because I ask you to give me something that's the most valuable on this planet is your time, right? And, and so information density is important to me. So that's one of the reasons why when I start a talk, I get right to it. I don't want to waste your time telling how awesome I am, where I work, what I do. Show me your, my cat pictures. I'm sorry, you didn't. You didn't come for that. You don't care, and right. I care about what you care, which is to learn about the material. So let's get going. And and the second thing, so the information density. How quickly can I get you to what you came here for? That is something I want to concentrate. Second is the knowledge deltas. And a lot of times we try to impress on the attendees and say, let me talk about how this works. And we completely lost the audience because they're like, whoa, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I am here and you are talking here, right? It's like you, uh, you know, Bruno, telling me to come to uh, you know, Sao Paulo, but you go to one airport and I arrive in another airport, it's not going to be a fun experience. Thankfully, that didn't happen. You are very responsible. <laughs> but the point really is that uh, you want to really meet the audience where they are, and that's extremely important. And, and once you meet them there, you want to walk with the deltas, never to take a bigger step. 
And, and one of the nice things about being in person often, which is not possible here, is I can look at the audience face and they are thinking, hey, that makes sense. Or they're thinking, what are you talking about? That has no meaning to me. And then you can like, oh, so their face shows that I'm taking a bigger leap. Let me scale back and go through a few more details to fill the gap. And, and the last thing I'll mention before I uh, you know, wrap this up is to me as a speaker, it is never about teaching everything on a topic to an attendee. How naive of me to even think that's possible. Mm -hmm. So my only goal is be that matchstick. You strike it and they are lit on fire and they will go back and explore it. You know, the best comment I ever got in all these years of speaking is I got an email at 2 a.m. from somebody who said, damn it, Venkat, it's 2 a.m. I listened to your talk at 10 a.m. yesterday <laughs> and I listened to it. I've never seen this before, but I got so excited and I'm here at 2 a.m. still working with the code and there is so much more to learn. What have you done to me? And I'm like, my job is over, right? So the point is, all you want to do is to get them excited enough so they go off and learn on their own. And, and I'm, I'm just a catalyst. That's all it is, right? And you just be there to strike the match, get them lighted up, and then you're done. And, and that's all you want to do is to give them enough so they take on the journey of learning from there on. That's awesome, man. You know, people are saying that's amazing. You know, uh, we are excited too. Um, the, the 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 presentation here is amazing. I mean, lo lots of praises for you. Thank you. And uh, there's one guy that says, you know, he, he wrote in Portuguese. He's saying that uh, the presentation, is, the live is is amazing, but I'm worried about Venkat uh, getting uh, codes in in out, in being outside, right? So I think <laughs> I think he thinks you're outside, Venkat. So that's <laughs> nice, by the way. This is a beautiful green screen here. <laughs> That's right. I'm so, actually stuck in my basement. So yeah. I, I, I am into the fifth month in my basement. <laughs> right. So Venkat, look, I, I, I like one thing that you said, right? You said, oh, I want to get right into what people want, right? And I have an impression that people want the giveaway, right? So, you know, so there is a suggestion here somewhere uh, I'm not sure which chat was done that, uh, I think it was from Juan, that you should uh, uh, run the giveaway by writing a random uh, function in, in, your, in your editor, right? Is that what you want to do? <laughs> what, 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 you know what? Why write a code when you can find a random number generator? That's good, right? <laughs> it's like it's magic. You, right? If you wanna, if you wanna do that, that's okay, right? <laughs> All right. I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, let uh, the other Bruno uh, decide on the winner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Bruno, you you're gonna run you're gonna run a random number right there. Yes. All right, so. It's, uh, we have between 1 and 30. I'm going to generate right now. Okay, 15. Let me see who is 15. It's a 16 line. Daniel Perestrello won the, the, the first ticket. Okay. All right, Daniel. Awesome, man. Okay, let's do the second one. 21. Judge the second line because we, we have a header over here. Vinicius Ferraz Campus. Okay, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know both. I can contact uh, them directly and uh, and uh, give the the step by step to take. Okay, the, Daniel take and Vinicius, congratulations for being here. Thanks, every, thanks, thanks very much for being here. And I'll, I'll, you know, we all see you guys at the event, right? Oh, Daniel saying, "You hoo, excellent, <laughs> cool." <laughs> Andre saying, "Great presentation, thanks, Venkat." Sassy saying it's 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 past midnight here at UK and you are more than just a speaker, great motivator and love the passion uh and wake me up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, cheers so much. Thank you thank so much you, for all of God. you and thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate it.
Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks you. so much, Vikash. Thank you. Okay, so thanks everyone. So you are watching us. Thanks everyone, uh, and and like I like to invite you guys. We're gonna do a international event this week uh, about career. So I'll I'll mess. I know we're gonna gonna post information about this in the next couple of days in the social media. So look for that. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.